Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 809. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm here with the Reverend Matt Kennedy. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. George has to attend a funeral today, so I have special guest Matt Kennedy on. He is a rector in New York, and we've had him on a couple times. Uh, he's aging gracefully while I am uh, losing <laughs> hair left and right. So how are you doing today, Matt? I'm doing wonderful. It's a great uh, privilege to be with you. I love this show. You do such great ministry for the ACNA and for Anglicanism in general. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'm on vacation myself. Uh, in an undisclosed location, so, so but with, <laughs> we're not going to do any. Um, but uh, I had not, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to name any names. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad. I'm really glad to be with you and uh, happy to talk to you. Sure. <laughs> now we have a. Uh, you know, you're somewhere on the East Coast. I'm somewhere in the Black Hills. Today's the internet's not going to be that friendly with us, but we're going to get through this uh, just fine. Uh, you and I have been following a story. Uh, about a church in uh, L.A. that's going to be renting from an active parish. It's going to be renting from an Episcopal parish. And uh, I read the first couple of paragraphs, and it seemed like we're just, it's just going to be a rental. And uh, I did a show, and I said, some people think Episcopalians just have cooties. That's me. And some, th some people read the fine print and say, there's more to the story, Kevin. You need to, to look at this. And uh, <laughs> that person was Matt Kennedy. So what is more to the story here? Well, thank you. Yes. Um, the, the more to the story is it's not just a rental. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, there are two, two major prongs to this. One is that there, there's a homeless ministry um, that they're both engaged in that they want to cooperate in. Um, and then secondly, there's they're both both sides, both All Saints, that's the name of the parish that, uh, that the, the ACNA church is renting from. The ACNA church is called La Res, um, I, I guess the resurrection of L.A. Mm -hmm. sure. um, and the, 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 they're both discussing and talking about their mutual ministry together as, as, as if they're both uh, siblings in Christ. There are two Christian congregations working together for the for the extension of the kingdom. In fact, uh, the the rector of of the ACNA, uh, church said something almost exactly like that. We're, we're this is a, a mutual work to extend the kingdom um, in our in our area. And you know the problem with that is is when you have a church that's affirming, which All Saints is, the Episcopal Church is an affirming church within a diocese that's one of the was at the forefront of the affirming movement, the Diocese of Los Angeles. Uh, you know this, Kevin, you've been in this, mm -hmm. this for a long time. The Diocese of Los Angeles has always been um, at the very center of, of this movement. Um, and so uh, the, if you say that, uh, if you say that a church like All Saints um, is a, a, a fellow Christian church uh, that were together advancing the kingdom, the gospel, um, but the problem is that All Saints is in the process of leading people into a sexual sin that, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, um, says that if people are unrepentant of it, homosexuality, that they cannot enter the kingdom of God. And, it, and it, that re, that, that's why in, in, in Kigali, the primate said that we, we just can't walk together. We can't do any kind of mutual ministry that those who are affirming have, in their words, they are quoting Jude here, uh, have departed from the faith once delivered to the saints. So if that's true, and since our archbishop signed the Kigali commitment, um, we agree with that. How can we have ACNA churches then talking about extending the kingdom, kingdom together, walking together with, uh, with Episcopal churches that are affirming? I can fully understand doing this with uh, a church that uh, is not affirming. There are some Episcopal churches that are still sure. solid or few and far between, but there are. And yeah. yeah well, for the longest time, I've uh, yeah. uh, well, for the longest time, I've said that the leadership in the Episcopal church or the Episcopal church leadership 
is not something I would even consider uh, ecumenical to work with at this point. You know, they have strayed so far. Interface. Uh, interface. Inter- yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, you know, it, it would be dealing, you know, with a, a non-Christian entity, which I, in my past, uh, uh, and currently as a Christian, I deal with non-Christian entities in homeless uh, ministries and other right. uh, things, uh, you know, across the country. Um, I don't have a problem dealing with non uh, ecumenical and non-religious entities, but the Episcopal Church here is trying to come off as the religious entity in America. That's that's the key issue right there. And Paul Paul mentions this when he mm-hmm. when he writes in First Corinthians chapter five. He, he he reminds them. He reminds the Corinthians of an earlier either letter or or instruction that he gave them, where he said, you know, don't associate um, with people who are idolaters or sexually immoral or who are who are leading people astray and he say he said i didn't mean not to associate with people in the world who are idolaters and who are doing all those things being sexual immoral because then you wouldn't be able to have that kind of ministry at all mm. um he meant those who are passing themselves off as as valid christians as people who are who are within the faith um don't he said he said with those don't even eat don't even share a meal um and same thing with uh same concern is in Second John. That's a small one of the small letters, smallest letters, shortest letters in the in the New Testament. Um, comes right after First John and before Third John. It's easy to find. Um, but the, in in Second John, verses nine through eleven, John says, "Hey, if anybody if anybody runs ahead of the apostles, if anybody's teaching something contrary to what the apostles taught, and they come to you, and he's is it, and I'm probably addressed to a, to a congregation, and they come to you." Uh, either for lodging or for some kind of fellowship, some kind of, uh, is don't even greet them. Um, don't welcome them into your home. Don't, don't greet them. That, that in the first century, that is a radical command because mm-hmm. hospitality uh, is such a, a, a great value um, for not just Jews, but everyone in that, at that, day, in that day and time. So to say you can't even give a greeting, you can't even welcome someone into your home who's traveling, maybe, uh, who's now who's preaching the gospel, who's who's run ahead of the apostles, um, and if you do, John says you participate um, with their wicked work. So you can be orthodox, um, but if you if you are teaming up with and and presenting um, someone who's heterodox as if they are not heterodox. Then you are therefore you become responsible in some way for for all the damage they do in that in their ministry. Uh, so it's it's a really frightening um, that, that last line of Second John. I think it's verse eleven. That last line is really frightening. When you, you you become a participant in what in what they're doing, and in well, this case, if what they're doing is leading people, sure. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, you're right. Yeah, I mean, they, they are leading uh, people astray uh, in one of the biggest topics of the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, it's it's and it, it's it's it, it, I can see, I can see why uh, the ACNA um, might be some in some way some parts of the ACNA might be swayed because there's a very strong evangelistic, a very strong missionary desire on the part of a lot of people in the AC that we've got to reach out, we've got to we've got to plant churches, mm-hmm. we've got to speak to our culture. I, I, I completely understand it. That's a good thing. I think what, you remember this, uh, Bishop Archbishop Duncan had the 5,000 churches in mm-hmm. planning, what was it, 1,000 churches in five 1, years? 1,000 churches, churches five years. Five years? Yeah. That's what it was, right? Yeah. And we, did, we didn't meet that goal, but, that, but that's how we started, right? We just, we just want to plant as many churches as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. Um, and back then, 2009, when, when the ACNA up, uh, things were headed in a really dangerous direction with regard to sexuality in our culture. But they weren't as bad as they are now. It was, mm-hmm. you could still, in 2009, you could still be uh, out as a Christian against the LGBTQ movement and still be considered mainstream. Um, it's getting a little scary, but you're still mainstream. Uh, that has completely changed now. 
you're you you now the mainstream has left us far behind. We're just we're we are uh, to be to be an orthodox Christian on the on the on the, on the, on the uh, question of sexuality is to be an enemy of of the culture. Um, not an enemy that not that we hate the culture, but the culture would consider us enemies um, in 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 our in our profession. So so because things have changed so dramatically, I can understand people not want, wanting to be the enemy of the culture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we've got it. We've got to make more people. We want people to come to our churches. We want people to be Christians. So let's lighten up a little bit on the sexuality talk. Let's let's. Uh, let's team up with people who are, you know, they, they are Episcopal church friends. They're affirming, they say the creed, and hey, I know Father So and So over here who, who says he believes in Jesus and he believes the Bible. And so we're just we're just kind of disagreeing about particulars. So why don't we drop this thing that's so culturally abominable and makes us look so bad and just kind of uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep our convictions, but we'll just walk together. Well, um, down this path and be attractive. Archbishop Duncan used to see, say, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. He also yeah. used to say, is we need to talk more about what we agree on than what divides us. Th- those were uh, quotes in my, my years of covering Archbishop Duncan. And that was fair in 2009, uh, 2010, and 11. Here we've come to a crossroads where the culture... Uh, I used to say in, in in the early 2000s, we've lost the benefit of the doubt. Here, we have become enemies to the culture yeah. uh, to the point where the, the, the sooner they cancel us, the better in their minds. And uh, right. the, I mean. the, the, the only, and this is sad, the only sign of hope I had in the last year is Bud Light. <laughs> Oh, right. The reaction against it. <laughs> yeah, that's the only, you know, but I like, oh, finally, well, it had to be about a beer, but finally, you know, the, the world's waking up, you know, ay, ay, ay. So. I do think there's, I do think there's some response, some reaction against, especially the extreme, the extreme trans movement where, mm-hmm. where, where people are trying to uh, mess with children. I and mean, of course, and people, that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an overstretch on sure. their part, I think, where, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Where people see this and say, oh, no, we can't do this. But listen to some of the, quote, unquote, con- politically conservative voices. They're not saying, let's just overthrow the whole movement. They're saying, let's go back to, like, 2015 yeah. and yeah, 2009, 2015, and where the tra- before the trans movement had started messing with children. And we're totally fine now with same-sex relationships. We're totally mm-hmm. fine with same-sex marriages. We just don't want the trans stuff. That's where the, that's a conservative position, quote unquote, conservative position now. Yeah. Um, so that, but that's the position that this is, you've heard of the Overton window shift, right? Yeah. That's what's happened is this is, is the mainstream is so shifted that, that what was normal in 2009 is abnormal and, and aberrant now, um, even though there is some pushback, even though you do see the, I, I was super encouraged by the Bud Light team too, and encouraged by the, the target thing. Yeah. Um, well, but, I think. But if if the past is any indication of future, it's it's gonna it's so this is a brief pushback. Well, I don't know if it's brief because the trans movement within the LGBT community is a cancer, because it's erasing lesbianism and it's erasing uh, homosexuality by taking those people who have those feelings and desires and taking a homosexual and and making him into a woman. And taking a lesbian who has uh, um, uh, desires for another uh, female uh, partner and making them into a male, and that's a cancer within the movement. Right. And I mean, so it, it's slowly going to wipe it out, um, in my opinion. Uh, uh, well, the Carl Truman writes about this in Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and he talks about how the LGB. Uh, LGB that that all depends on the sexual on, on the binary between male and female. You can't mm-hmm. have uh, uh, you can't have you can't be an L or a G or B unless you assume the sexual binary. Right. But but then the trans of course blows that apart. However, the one thing that they all all the L G B and T all agree on, and this is the threat to the gospel, I think, uh, the core of it anyway, 
is that your identity comes from within, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you look within to see where your desires lie, what, how you, how you experience your sexuality. Mm -hmm. And then that is who you are. Right. And, uh, and everything outside you has to bend to that. So if, if you're, what, except the sexual binary or not, that core agreement they all have makes them more allies against you know, traditional Christianity than enemies against each other. Uh, no, they, uh, right. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah. Well, there's a lot of truth to what you just said. Because when I, I hang out uh, in the, the desist uh, areas of Twitter uh, and uh, the detrans areas of uh, Facebook, uh, as part of my ministry to you know help people who finally realized I made a, a horrible mistake. Where do I go from here? You know what they do? Every one of them hates God still. Every one of them hates Christians and blames yeah. Christians for them making a bad mistake. Uh, and uh, even though they they they're coming to a realization that they were in a trans cult for three or four years, um, once they get out of that cult and they're, they're thinking straight, they still hate God, they still hate Christians. Yeah. You know, it's a very hard place yeah. for me to hang out. So, uh, <laughs> well, think about. It. I mean, this is why Paul says the gospel is such an offense, or the cross is such an offense, or because because uh, the core of the human fallen nature, the flesh, wants to be its own king own god its own savior right mm -hmm. I, I i want i don't want to have to rely on somebody else to save me i want to think that i'm fine by myself and in fact i want everyone else to think i'm not only fine but i'm god and and so that that's that's the flesh everybody wants that that goes all the way back to the garden when adam and eve said you know we're gonna uh we are gonna decide to know good and evil for ourselves and not trust god to to give us what's good or to show us what's evil um we want to be like gods so so of course um, Christianity is going to be the enemy of of the flesh. The, 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 I think the cross is an offense because it says you can't you save yourself. Not only are you not your own God, uh, but you're so bad that God had to come down here <laughs> and, and die for you uh, to take away your sins because you were so hopeless, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's good news if you can accept it. Like if you can receive that, which caught, it becomes the most wonderful and beautiful news ever. That you're you can be forgiven that your guilt's taken away that god loves you and, and wants to be with you forever uh and just but it's also that it's the, the hump of getting over okay i'm a sinner i i've i'm condemned because of my sin i shouldn't be the way that i am that just is so counterculture that hits that cuts against so much of the of the modern grain that it, it's it takes the Holy Spirit to bring someone to that point, I think, where they're willing to acknowledge that. So, Well, I mean, now in society, the only sinners are the old white man, you and me, okay, <laughs> the boomer. <laughs> with, our, with our gray hair. And our, <laughs> with our gray right. hair. Uh, <laughs> and our and the only sinners out there are uh, Americans, uh, you know, the, the, right. the colonialist. Uh, and so the biggest part of the modern culture is to take away our voice take away our experience take away our reason and every time we say you know that's not right science says this well science happens to be slavery you know science is this and science yeah, yeah. and oh, so yeah. they've redefined everything and when you redefined or undefined all the terms that we can have a conversation about uh it leaves us powerless yeah absolutely the science cult is a very interesting one too i mean if you just study the history of science for the last 100 years mm -hmm. it, there is no the science <laughs> it it, the, it shift it changes the, the science changes so dramatically quite often mm -hmm. um that that there's no there's no resting place if you're going to rest if you're going to place your trust in what the science says well you're going to rest in one place now but in another different very different place in 10 years and you would have rested in another place 10 years before that um not to say science is bad it's a wonderful gift from god but um but if you're going to rest your whole uh, self in the conclusions of the main the, the the conclusions and the main assertions of science in our day then you're resting in a sh in shifting sands it's, it's not well it is shifting sand i mean we just had james webb telescope ran a three-day um test 
and disproved the Big Bang Theory. Oh, all gone. <laughs> yeah, I've read about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I read it. <laughs> you know, you know, so, oh, boy. Well, now yeah. we're back. So it, the two big main uh, creation uh, stories were Big Bang and Creation. So, well, creation's still there if you want to fall back on that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. uh, science yeah. is about uh, testing a hypothesis yeah, in true science. And I like mm -hmm. that, you know, true scientists continue to do that. But we're to the point now where culture is saying that science is um, a despot as well. Uh, it's part of colonialism. Yeah. It's part of... Uh, you know, uh, slavery. It's part of, you know, all these types of things where we, we, we will never trust science. And so there's nothing they will trust except their feelings. Well, right. I mean, that, and that's, you're seeing that even, this is why science has become such a, a, a battleground because culture has now come, now, now has, so has shaped the science. So you saw this during COVID. I don't, we don't have to get into COVID if you want to, but you see it during, um, you see it during uh, the, the trans argument. You know, how, how can uh, men and women who have uh, degrees in medicine um, and know very well, know very well that puberty blockers are dangerous for children um, and that, you know, ripping the skin off someone's forearm to, to create a male appendage on a female is, I mean, that's not science. That's, mm -hmm. they'll say it's science. That's yeah. not science. Correct. Yeah. That is ideology. And, and it's driving the, it's driving the science train now, at least in, at least in elite circles. Uh, there are other voices, thank goodness, but. But that's uh, that's the that's driving the train I, ideology now. So you got to really be careful, even trusting. So I guess it's always been that way. It's just it's just more evident now that um, that something so radically insane, like mutilating children and, and blocking puberty, has become mainstream science. That it's noticeable now for a lot of people. Well, I think. So, the, remember the seminary, like go ahead. You got, well, throughout recorded history, we've always seen these social contagions. You know where you know, and sometimes it's a, it's just a, an effect of going back and forth. Uh, the the current social contagion is feelings. You know, and right. identity, yeah. and I don't know if it's a reaction to the you know the porn community or a reaction to um, just how online everybody is, but how how do you identify your attraction to somebody, and how is that reflected? Yeah. Now, you and yeah, I come I mean, I, from I, I, well, you and I come from the '80s, when it was easy to start dating. Uh, it was easy to uh, understand our, you know, you know, have examples in our parents uh, of how you express your feelings towards one another, and uh, you know, and desires towards one another. That doesn't exist anymore. I talk to kids all right. the time who don't know how to uh, express that desire towards another person. That's absolutely right. I mean, you, you, we live in a time where you can you can craft reality around yourself. You can you can create your own uh, online uh, quote unquote communities made up of people you maybe you may never meet in person. Sure. Um, but that you have but that they share your beliefs and share your values, share your ideas, share your everything that you believe they believe. Um, and then you can shape your experience of life by going to those places online you want to go. And and so really what's what technology has enabled us to do is to is is to have the desire of the fallen heart, to, to be our own gods, to just create a, to create an environment. Uh, in which everybody revolves around us, like like I'm the sun, and my online community are the, <laughs> are the planets. Um, and you're right that break that breaks down what you and I were raised on the human interaction, eye to eye contact. Oh, I've got this person's not me, and this person's maybe in my church, and that means I've got to learn to love this person, even though this person really annoys me. I can't just cut them cut them out of my online community and you know, and have a more comfortable. Uh, a more comfortable existence. Um, 
so so yeah that the, the 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 love of self the inner emotional need to um to be to to express the self uh, uh, is has become dominant and technology has allowed it to become a tyrant so that, mm-hmm. so that you don't have uh you don't have to ever break down the wall of self you can you're, you're it's a, it's a very narcissistic world that um that the the technology allows us to live in and, and dwell in. That's a, one reason I think the church is so wonderful if people actually go to it, not an online church, but actually going to a church mm-hmm. is it's the it's one of the one places we have left where where there's some other authority above yourself, right? Um, um, who defines who you are, who tells you who tell who, who diagnoses your your sin, who gives you um, who gives you freedom liber- liberation from yourself and from the desires that are that are enslaving you um and says uh god says not only love me but also love your neighbor and then he sticks other people in that congregation and i think he does this on purpose he sticks other people in the congregation you don't like right <laughs> you don't like people who are, who are very different than you and and, yeah. the, and the temptation you know in the early '90s, the temptation was, "Hey, you know, let's start a home church." So I don't. We can, we can, we can just. I don't have a, a big problem against home church. I'm just saying, one of the bad emphases on in that movement was, "Let's get a whole bunch of people who are just like us to meet together and have a meal, and then get away from the annoying people in the bigger church, and we have our own nice, cozy community." And that sounds great, but the problem, but, the, but what God wants you to do in church is to come up against people who. Um, who you don't like and who don't like you and 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 be forced to sort through that command to love them anyway mm-hmm. um, so yeah, which, yeah. again technology is allevi- alleviated that responsibility in the perfect world that god desired church was always going to be a struggle because it's to help you grow okay right. church was Absolutely. church is here to help you grow as an individual and you can't grow in a cliche you can't grow in a click <laughs> sorry right <laughs> you can try um if you if i could find a click where uh, a whole bunch of men who wore blue polo shirts and had no hair hung out all day and, and drank wine <laughs> i wouldn't grow <laughs> I, you know, so <laughs> it just it, it ain't gonna happen uh okay yeah, yeah, yeah. i, I want to thank you so much for your, your time you gave me a half an hour of, of uh, good quality material for the audience to chew on um i'm gonna put a uh now somebody uh on facebook said oh i wish stan firm were still around People stopped checking uh, a, a while ago because you guys were stan firm was yeah. down for a couple years and yeah we, we actually had russian bots attack stand firm and okay. they, they took us down and we were so all of us were so busy at the time none of us had time to get into it sure uh but it relaunched it's we're, we're back uh we don't read we, we're there's articles the article we, we've shifted focus like you you guys in anglican inc are focused like we were before on news mm-hmm. and sure. on reporting on the news and commenting on the news anglican news um we've we've moved more to commentary um so you'll and apologetics within Anglicanism. So mm-hmm. you'll find us talking about things like the res, LA res issue. Um, and we, we, our primary thing that we do now is podcasts. So this came from podcasts is, is out um, and it's doing really well. I've been surprised by, well, who wants to listen to three guys just talking all the time, but we, we do get it, uh, pretty good uh, <laughs> stats on that. And <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But we do, yeah. The Stanford and Faith is still a still a thing. So you should look, look at. There's a lot of articles on there. A lot of good content. So yeah, that's how I can tell the world has gone crazy and the church is still crazy. When uh, George and I or uh, you and your podcast can put content out there and it, it it's read or it's watched or it's listened to by tens of thousands of people. And I like that's how screwed up the church still is. <laughs> There's your sign. <laughs> so. We shouldn't have jobs. We shouldn't. No, yeah, right. Shouldn't. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm Kevin Carlson, and I've been with Matt Kennedy. And we I'm thank Matt you Kennedy. for yep. Yeah, and we thank you for watching episode 809 of Anglican Unscripted. Mm-hmm.